In this and the next few videos we're going to look at the polar form of conic sections and by now you should be familiar with the three types of conic sections. We have the ellipse with its standard equation of x squared on a squared plus y squared on b squared equals 1. We have the parabola with its standard equation of y squared is equal to 4ax and we have the hyperbola with its standard equation of x squared on a squared minus y squared on b squared equals 1. Now each of these equations are known as the Cartesian form of their respective conic section. But the cool thing when we start to deal with the polar form of conic sections is that all of these equations can be reduced down to one form. And in this video we'll derive the equation of the polar form. Alright, now the polar form is very useful in topics such as orbital mechanics. So if you ever go on to study physics or mechanical and aerospace engineering, you'll become very familiar with the polar form when you are studying the motion of objects in space. So having said that, let's recap the definition of a conic section. Now a conic section is formed by the motion of a point P in a two-dimensional plane and the point P moves in respect to a fixed point called the focus and a straight line called the directrix. Let's call this D. Now conic section is formed when the ratio of the distance from P to F, let's call this the distance PF, and the distance from P to the directrix, the perpendicular distance from P to the directrix, Let's call this point on the directrix M and we'll give this the distance of PM. A conic section is formed when the ratio of PF to PM is a constant called the eccentricity or E for short. So talking about orbital mechanics, the point F might be say the center of planet Earth and the point P might be the center of mass of an asteroid or a satellite that's in Earth's orbit. And the point F is going to be the pole for the polar coordinate system and we'll give it the Cartesian coordinates of 0, 0. And because F is the pole, this is where we will set up our horizontal reference axis or the polar axis. So in terms of polar coordinates, the point P, it is at a distance of R from the pole. So R is also equal to PF. And the ray R is at an angle of theta with respect to the polar axis. So the point P has R, theta as the polar coordinates. And as for the point M, we'll leave this in Cartesian form. So it has the Cartesian coordinates of little d and a floating y coordinate. So with the equation PF on PM is equal to E, we can rearrange this so that PF is equal to E times PM. PF we said was equal to R and now PM is equivalent to the distance from the focus of the directrix minus the horizontal component of the ray R. Alright, so this distance marked in red has the distance of D and the distance marked in blue has a value of R cos theta. So the distance PM is D minus R cos theta. So we have R is equal to E outside of D minus R cos theta. So if we expand the E in, we have R is equal to ED minus ER cos theta. And let's move this term with the R to the other side, which gives us on the left hand side R plus R times E cos theta is equal to ED. We can factor out an R, so we have R outside of 1 plus E cos theta equals ED. And now if we move this 1 plus E cos theta term to the other side, we'll isolate R as ED over 1 plus E cos theta. And what we have derived here is the polar form of conic sections. Okay, but how do we prove that this equation does indeed form a conic section. Well, let's refer to this 
equation above here, this r equals e outside of d minus r cos theta. Actually, in fact, we'll use the one below it. The r is equal to e d minus e r cos theta. Let's refer to that as equation one. And for this proof, we'll need the relationship between Cartesian and polar coordinates. And these are given by r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, where x is equal to r cos theta and y is equal to r sine theta. Alright, so with equation 1, where we have r is equal to e times d minus e r cos theta. So this is an equation purely in polar coordinates. And what we're doing with this process is translating it back into Cartesian coordinates. And I warn you now that we are in for quite a bit of tedious algebra, so please bear with me. So with r, if we translate that back into Cartesian form, we have the square root of x squared plus y squared is equal to the ed remains the same minus e so the ed and the e remain the same this here this r cos theta we can express as x so we have the square root of x squared plus y squared is equal to ed minus ex now if we square both sides i'll have x squared plus y squared is equal to ed minus ex all squared and binomially expanding the right hand side we'll get e squared d squared minus 2 times the first term times the second term so we'll have e squared dx and plus the second term squared so we'll have plus e squared x squared all right now let's move the x terms to the left hand side so this gives us x squared minus e squared x squared plus 2 e squared dx plus y squared is equal to e squared d squared. Now I can factor out an x squared in the front two terms here. So I can rewrite this as 1 minus e squared by x squared. Let me write this a bit more neatly. So I'll have 1 minus e squared by x squared. And now if I divide both sides by 1 minus e squared, the expression will turn into x squared plus 2 times e squared d divided by 1 minus e squared times x plus y squared on 1 minus e squared is equal to e squared d squared over 1 minus e squared. Okay, so it's looking pretty ugly and it's not going to get any better because what we have to do now is to complete the square for the x terms. Now to complete the square, let's say we have the expression x plus some constant, let's say that's equal to u, all squared. So we have a perfect square of x plus u and if we expand this we will get x squared plus 2ux plus u squared. So what we want to do is to write this x squared plus this ugly term by x into a perfect square. So here we have an x or an x squared and here we also have an x squared. We have a 2 here and we have a 2 here and the x here corresponds to this x. So what we have is then u must be equal to e squared times d divided by 1 minus e squared and let's make a division down this page so we can write on the other half so what we need to do with this left hand side here is to add the u squared term and if we add the u squared term because it wasn't here before we also have to add a u squared term to the right hand side to make it or to make both sides equivalent so the expression becomes x squared plus 2 e squared d on 1 minus e squared times x plus the u squared term. So u squared here is equal to e squared d on 1 minus e squared all squared then plus y squared 
and I'll have to write on the next line equals to e squared d squared divided by 1 minus e squared plus the u squared again which will be e squared d divided by 1 minus e squared all squared all right now this the first three terms here now can be rewritten as a perfect square of x plus e squared d divided by 1 minus e squared all squared so we have x plus u all squared the plus y we can copy that down and we can simplify the right hand side a little bit so we can make the right hand side if we expand this square into the parentheses we get e squared d squared well the first term remains the same the second term because we've expanded the square into the parentheses we'll have e to the fourth by d squared divided by 1 minus e squared all squared the next step is to get a common denominator between the two terms and I do that by multiplying the first term the top and bottom by 1 minus e squared so I have e squared d squared by 1 minus e squared plus e to the fourth d squared over 1 minus e squared all squared and expanding the e squared d squared into the parentheses we have e squared d squared minus e, e to the fourth d squared plus e to the fourth d squared on 1 minus e squared all squared and of course these two terms cancel each other and we are left with the equation x plus e squared d over 1 minus e squared all squared plus y squared on 1 minus e squared is equal to e squared d squared divided by 1 minus e squared squared now the ugly maths has not stopped yet let's divide both sides now by e squared d squared on 1 minus e squared squared so each of these terms now are also divided by e squared d squared 1 minus e squared squared okay so we can cancel the index here the right hand side is equal to 1 cancelling out the 1 minus e squared with the squared simplifies the second term to this now if I rewrite this plus as a double negative and we let a equals ed divided by 1 minus e squared we let b equals ed divided by the square root of 1 minus e squared we let p equals negative e squared d divided by 1 minus e squared and we let q equals 0 then this equation simplifies to x minus p all squared divided by a squared plus y minus q all squared divided by b squared equals 1 and does this equation look familiar it is the Cartesian form of an ellipse that has its center at the coordinates p q and I forgot to mention one very important thing this is assuming that the eccentricity e is a number between 0 and 1 okay so the polar form r is equal to ed divided by 1 plus e cos theta is an ellipse centered at negative e squared d divided by 1 minus e squared comma 0 okay so before I wrap up this video I just want to make sure that c equals ea is also valid for the polar form now c is the distance from the center to the focus where e is the eccentricity and a is the length of the semi-major axis as we've established 
when we derive the Cartesian form of the ellipse. And also from when we derive the Cartesian form, this b squared term here, we said was really a more convenient way of writing a squared minus c squared. And if you're not familiar with this, I'll include a link to that video. But we can rearrange this equation to c squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. And from above, a squared is equal to e squared d squared on 1 minus e squared squared minus b squared, which is e squared d squared on 1 minus e squared. So finding a common denominator, we'll get e squared d squared minus e squared d squared by 1 minus e squared all over 1 minus e squared squared. This simplifies down to positive e to the fourth times d squared divided by 1 minus e squared squared. Taking the square root of both sides we get c is equal to e squared d over 1 minus e squared which is equal to e times with a being equal to ed on 1 minus e squared, we have c is equal to ea. Okay, so this relationship is still valid for the polar form. So note that because the focal point was at the origin, that the point p, which is the x-coordinate of the center point, is simply the negative of c. I think we'll leave it there for this video. I apologize for the heavy algebra, but it does get better from here because on the next video we'll look at some of the variations of this polar form and we'll start to apply it in some examples. Please like my video if you have found it useful and don't forget to subscribe and check out my channel for more videos that may help you with your homework or assignments. Until next time, best of luck with your studies.